Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first Thursday meeting for August 5th, 2021. I'm Stokes McMillan. Today, our speaker is uh, Dr. Larry Kuznets. Uh, and so Larry holds advanced degrees from Columbia University and the University of California, Berkeley. His first project with NASA was a filtration system for the Apollo command module that prevented the return of hypothetical pathogens from the moon. Following Apollo, he was assigned to the build team at the Kennedy Space Center responsible for the installation and final construction of Space Shuttle Columbia prior to his first flight. Then, following a decade of consulting and teaching, during which he earned eight U.S. patents in the field of extreme environment protection, he returned to JSC as an experiments manager for the Human Research Program on the shuttle and the International Space Station. In 2012, Dr. Kuznets left NASA to create the, uh, the is something called the Hypernet Paradigm, which is a project-based STEAM learning tool. And he used it to form the Mars Suit Project, which is a space suit and life support system for the exploration of Mars. That's, and this is now under construction. In the wake of, of COVID-19, he formed Planetary Protect and created the Q-suit for future pandemic protection by preventing forward and backward contamination. And so now it was my pleasure to hand the program over to Dr. Larry Kuznets. Larry? Hey Stokes, thanks for the introduction. Uh, that's, that's a lot of years condensed into a couple of minutes. Makes me feel like my life is flying by like a lot of us know. <laughs> but, uh, let me, uh, let me switch over to screen share and we can um, start the presentation. Okay, does everybody uh, see this? No, no, I'm not seeing your screen. You're not seeing it? Uh, let's see, I pushed screen share. Share, con oh, share content screen. Oh, start broadcast, that's the thing. Okay, I guess that's it. Okay, how about now? Yeah, now we got it. Okay, so uh, let, me get, uh, let me get to the, this, this kind of is, the way this happened was pretty interesting. In the midst of the, uh, uh, the pandemic about a year and a half ago, uh, while working on uh, developments for a Mars spacesuit, uh, I woke up in the middle of the night and realized that, um, as you'll soon see, one of the hallmarks of the Mars spacesuit we're designing is uh, planetary protection and preventing a prevention of forward and backwards contamination. And um, this light bulb moment uh, came and said, well, maybe you can use some of that same, that same technology to design a, something that might stop uh, coronavirus. And that's what started the whole thing off. And so um, first thing I did is I called a bunch of people, smart people that I knew, uh, see if they wanted to uh, get on board with us. And we formed this group called Planetary Protect. Uh, our hallmark is preparation, protection, and prevention. And uh, Mr. Gene Grace, the CEO, he's on the line. And Cameron Smith is a, a spacesuit fabricator. And then we have Mark Arnold, technical and strategic advisor, and Mr. Alan Boynes, media network. Uh, so it sounds like a lot of uh, organizations. It's actually uh, five guys just uh, putting in the hours and, and, and trying to move this forward, move this idea uh, forward to, to something that's, uh, that might be beneficial. So. Uh, to start the whole thing off, uh, so our goal, our goal is to build a uh, pathogen protective suit with optimum defense against COVID-19, and this is important, and future pandemic. This is not just, the idea is not just for COVID-19. So, uh, of course, uh, you got to start with definitions if you're going to do something like this. So what's a, what's a pandemic? 
uh, pandemic is a rapidly spreading pathogen initially of unknown origin that is potentially fatal. It crosses domestic and international boundaries. Uh, and uh, in the beginning, the entry and exit mode are poorly understood. Again, it contaminates in the forward and backwards direction and uh, mitigation strategies are slow to develop and there are usually quite a few of them as, as we all know. So given that as the definition of a pandemic, how does this relate to anything NASA has done? And to understand that, uh, what's the involvement of the space community? We need to go back all the way uh, to 1958. Uh, when COSPAR was formed, the International Committee for Space Research. Uh, so it was formed shortly after NASA was formed. As you all know, NASA was formed in 1958. So COSPAR recognized the potential uh, for alien pathogens of unknown origin to cross planetary and galactic boundaries. And in so doing, they created eventually Article 11 of the 1967 Outer Space Treaty which states all spacefaring nations must, quote, avoid harmful contamination resulting from the introduction of extraterrestrial matter, unquote. Uh, forward contamination uh, control was mandated for all outbound planetary missions, primarily using clean room sterilization as we're familiar with, and also backward contamination control was mandated for all inbound returning planetary missions coming from the moon, Mars, and beyond. Okay, so uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, next slide is an image of forward contamination control, and it shows uh, a Perseverance rover uh, undergoing sterilization in a clean room prior to launch. Uh, so uh, quite a few uh, safeguards are taken to make uh, rogues like this as sterile as possible. It's not perfect, but it's, uh, it's quite a job to do this. And backwards contamination, the history, my familiarity uh, started with Apollo. It was first used in the Apollo program. And the strategy back then was if moon bugs exist to prevent their release on earth. So uh, you can imagine, I'm, uh, I'm just graduating. Columbia, and um, I'm, my first couple of days on the job working for uh, crew and thermal sy crew system division at the time. And Dick Johnston, who some of you may be familiar with, uh, said, well, why don't we put you on this job uh, about moon bugs? And nobody really took that seriously. Nobody thought there were moon bugs. And uh, everything 1967 was, uh, was pretty much designed uh, there were not going to be any major uh, modifications to the hardware. So what it was decided to do uh, was uh, kind of, lit, kind of uh, uh, limit the design process to something that wasn't going to interfere and yet give it, give it some attempt at doing anything. So where was this uh, prevention going to happen? And it was decided it was going to be post-landing at sea. And when was this contamination going to be prevented? It was going to be following splashdown in the command in the command module. And how was it going to be done? And it was going to be done through what we call a chain of protection, maintaining a chain of protection, basically depending on quarantine. So if you go to the next slide, it shows what the chain of protection was. And you can see the 1967 date up there. NASA uh, ID. So what it meant was when, uh, when Apollo splashed town and it was recovered at sea, uh, the, the, uh, it was gonna be recovered, it was gonna be placed on an aircraft carrier and items, re items re returned uh, directly were gonna go uh, to the lunar uh, receiving laboratory and the crew and uh, associated material with the crew was gonna go to the nearest land uh, a base which was in Hawaii and then flown to again to the Johnson Space Center then the Manned Spacecraft Center uh, again to the Lunar Receiving Lab. So this this was this was how uh, the chain of quarantine was to be instituted. 
and uh, including for specimens of uh, lunar, lunar specimens, moon rocks, the crew surface, any, anything coming back. So let's, let's, let's take a look at this chain, starting with the first point of, uh, of it. So the first chain I, A, which is the project that I ended up uh, working on was filters in the command module post ventilation system. So there was already a post landing ventilation system. It was used to, to cool the command module at sea post landing. Uh, very difficult job since it wasn't an active system and you're landing off, the, off of the, in the Pacific, it's pretty hot. Uh, and uh, I decided um, to place a filter over that ventilation system that would capture any, quote, moon bugs. And of course, that led to a whole, a whole bunch of questions. And, and most people kind of wink when, when I was talking about this and, and trying to do this. So I picked the, fil the smallest filter that I could. And if you pick too small of a filter, it's going to impede a, the airflow of the fan. And it's going to make the crew get hot as blazes in there. And so you had to have a combination of what size filter would not impede the flow rate of the uh, ventilation fan and still provide adequate uh, cooling as, as it was, which still was not gonna be that great because there was no active cooling inside the command module post landing. But anyway, that was, that's the first chain, filters in the post landing system. The second step in the chain was a biological isolation garment uh, designed to stop pathogen exit not entry, and here you see a picture of what we call the big. And this was designed, again, if uh, any, any uh, moon bugs had gotten uh, infected the crew, it would be uh, prevented from getting out through this, uh, through this device. Same question about what kind of filters, what size filters, is it gonna be any good? And it, the whole thing was kind of uh, a, a little bit laughable because the set, as soon as the frogmen come to bring the crew back to the, the Hornet, in this case for Apollo 11, they open up the hatch and anything that's floating around the command nozzle is going to get out anyway. But just it, we were giving this uh, the best attempt we could considering the timing and the fact that not many people other than the life science community was taking it very seriously. Uh, the, set, the third step here where most of us are familiar with was the mobile quarantine vehicle. And here you see uh, um, a crew of Apollo 11 on board the Hornet with uh, President Nixon greeting them. This is after they were captured. So the, 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 uh, the uh, uh, Estrian trailer was designed to maintain quarantine and not shown, <clears throat> by the way, in the background is my very close friend and roommate at the time, John Hirosaki. Whose, whose job working for landing recovery division was to be the chief cook and bottle washer of, uh, uh, and taking care of the crew. He was also under quarantine. Uh, so following, uh, following um, um, this step, the next step was to move the quarantine vehicle, the MQF, to the Johnson Space Center. And uh, this was quite a big deal because uh, the Lunar Receiving Laboratory had been built to maintain quarantine for at least 14 days, keep the crew under quarantine, uh, and to uh, be a re receiving point for, their, uh, for the samples, all the lunar samples. So um, it was used on Apollo 1114 until the threat was eventually discounted. One of the features many people don't know about, about the LRL, I actually ended up working in the LRL for the last part of my career between 2005 and 2012. Uh, set, and a lot of the people working there didn't even know it was used for this purpose. It had become the life science headquarters for the human research program. But uh, the entire building was kept at a lower pressure than ambient to stop pathogen exit. The section of the lunar receiving laboratory that housed the crew and those attending the crew were kept at a lower pressure so that Anything, nothing would get out. If anything got in, it was okay for people to get colds or, or whatever coming from the outside. But any, uh, any pathogens that might be inside the building would not get out. <clears throat> if you look at the uh, lower images, you see, <clears throat> you see uh, the entire quarantine uh, um, personnel. Uh, some folks might even be in this uh, picture or watching with uh, Neil Buzz and uh, and, and um, Mike Collins on the far left. And, uh, and then you see a ceremony that we had back in 2010 commemorating all this and Neil and Buzz uh, cutting a cake commemorating the entire lunar receiving lab operations. Okay, <clears throat> so 
Oh, that's all the history. So it, it leads to a question, a basic question. Wouldn't you want to stop the, the uh, quarant wouldn't you want to stop the intrusion in the chain of uh, protection before you actually get to planet Earth? Doesn't it make sense to stop it where it starts rather than wait until the last possible minute? Can you do it in, in, in space or on the moon, on Mars? These are all questions. And uh, the first point of, of, uh, of serious consideration has to be a spacesuit. <clears throat> so let's take a look. Yes, you would want to stop it. <laughs> but the point being, uh, all spacesuits from Apollo through shuttle, International Space Station suits, and even today's space suit uh, of uh, the Artemis program, the XCMU, are not designed to stop pathogens. Uh, you can see in the image on the left, Apollo 12, uh, <clears throat> Apollo 12 A7LB spacesuit outgassing and depositing effluent on the lunar surface. Uh, this is clear violation of Article 11, uh, Art Article 11 of the Outer Space Treaty. <clears throat> so once it's getting out, it's also getting in. So you have forward and backward contamination. Houston, we do have a problem. We didn't know it back then, but we certainly know it now. Uh, what if you extend this to Mars missions? Uh, Mars missions, uh, whatever you think about the moon in terms of pathogens, Mars is gonna be worse. There's a higher probability of extent and extinct life. There's a higher probability of pathogens. So <clears throat> it looks pretty bad, but a solution uh, came across because of work that we've done here at UC Berkeley and later at NASA and actually started at NASA Ames on a postdoc on the design of a Mars spacesuit. And one of the features of the Mars spacesuit was it had to stop forward to Mars and backwards to Earth contamination. Uh, in, in this drawing, you see it uses a combination of uh, viral filters at the inlet and outlet of the suit. And if you're asking yourself, what are you doing with an inlet and an outlet for a suit that's sort of, you know, either doesn't have any, uh, doesn't have a, uh, a pop, it doesn't have an atmosphere or it has a contaminated atmosphere, it's a good question. And to answer that question, uh, let me give you a brief history of, of the Mars suit project development since it started in 2012. Uh, it started as a postdoc at uh, NASA Ames. It went through a whole series of classes starting in 2012. It went to uh, some project work I did at uh, JSC when I was back there and it's ongoing. Uh, so uh, without getting into a great a deal of depth, because there's a video link at the bottom of this page that you can click to find all about the Mars suit. But uh, what was paramount about this was a very unusual feature called helmet torso independence. And the notion being that the helmet would be pressurized by oxygen and the torso would be pressurized by the Mars environment because we had an environment, we had an atmosphere. And uh, you might ask, why do you want to do that? And there's multiple reasons. Uh, one big reason is if you could indeed separate the helmet from the torso, you could use the external pressure, ambient pressure of Mars to pressurize the torso. And in so doing, have a gigantic mass reduction because you would have an open loop system. You would not even need heat exchangers, big pumps, multi-layer insulation, a whole assortment of stuff. And, uh, and that's really important because the gravity on Mars is 38%. And if you take a 400 pound space suit, which is what we're pushing today and multiply it 48% of that, you get a space suit that's way too heavy to use. Any space suit that's on the, on the boards today will not work on Mars simply because the mass is way too heavy. It requires almost a two thirds reduction. Uh, in fact, the Earth, Earth mass needs to be about 135 pounds in order to get uh, about a 50 pound mass, equivalent mass on Mars, which is if you're gonna work all day long, that's about the most you can carry. So that's one big reason. Another big reason was uh, to prevent um, uh, emergencies. If you get a, uh, a puncture in the suit, uh, you're not gonna lose all the oxygen. You can maintain pressurization by just continually pumping the Mars atmosphere into the suit and out. Now, the way this works, you pump the suit in through a compressor 
and you pump this and you and you pump the the, uh, the air out the atmosphere out through a relief valve and you set them set them up so that they both maintain about a five psi uh, pressure inside the suit. Uh, it reduces uh, oxygen leak, but one of, and also consumables usage. Uh, you use institutes. There's a lot of different reasons. If you really want to get into all of it, there's an hour presentation at that video link below to tell you why uh, all of this was done and how it was done and the reasons for doing it and why it would work. But the big one that's relevant here is planetary contamination minimized. So we knew right from the get-go that had to be done. Okay, so what does all this have to do with COVID-19? I'll go to the next slide. And uh, what it has to do with is we, we created this group that we started back a year and a half ago, created the Q suit, Q stands for quarantine. Some people say it should be a C for containment, but I like the Q. Uh, a lightweight, inexpensive, reusable suit based on Mars suit technology that has been designed to provide optimum defense against COVID-19 and future pandemics. So that's, uh, that's the relationship here. So what is it, how did it work and how did it migrate from, from the, the situation we had that you noticed in Apollo 12 all the way to, to where we are today, which is uh, through five revisions and pre-manufacture. Okay, so as, as any of us working for NASA know, everything starts with requirements. And the way we, I put the requirements for the Mars suit and the Q suit side by side, so we can see how these balanced out and how they, they equilibrate. And they, they basically are save mass, conserve power, save oxygen, extend emergency survival time, mitigate forward and backwards contamination, reduce helmet gas contaminants, use the environment, simplify components, extend operation time, and reduce costs. So these are requirements that uh, we uh, started with with the Mars suit and have extended to the Q suit. Let's go to the next slide. So uh, I want to review the major features of the Q suit, and we'll start off with a couple of NASA type acronyms, because that's the easiest to visualize how you can use this for a pandemic with these two acronyms, which are BB and FE. You see right number one and two, BB and FE. BB stands for barrier to entry and barrier to exit. So the suit has to be designed so that nothing gets in, but if a person gets in who happens to have a virus, it's not gonna get out. Now you'll see underneath that, there's a, uh, a Vimeo link. Uh, please don't click it now because it'll, you can click it later on. You're gonna have this, this, uh, this uh, file to, to look at it. Each one is a 30 second, 45, second uh, video of the particular feature. Uh, and we'll see more of that at the end. So I don't, I didn't want to take up too much time. Uh, the next uh, acronym is EFI, double F, double A. Uh, that the requirements meant no face-to-face -face exposure, face-to-face -face exposure elimination, FFEE. That meant that there could be no openings in the front of the suit. And, and the reason for that is pretty clear. When, when you catch a virus, uh, both in a hospital setting or in a, in a crowd or in places you shouldn't be, you're usually going to get it from face-to-face -face, uh, exposure, dealing with somebody face-to-face -face and close up. That's the whole reason for masks. So uh, to, to, to implement this requirement, we, we dictated absolutely no openings of any kind could exist in the suit. The only openings that would be in the suit would be in the rear and they would be close to the floor. We'll get about. We'll get to that later. Uh, next feature was the ease of donning and doffing. It was an important imperative that this suit you had to be able to get in and out of it in sixty seconds or less. Uh, next step was uh, needed to be lightweight. You didn't want to be carrying around the equivalent of a spacesuit with you. Uh, had to be very lightweight. It had to be, have a full range of motion. It had to had to, had to provide dexterity uh, in gloves and, and moving around. Uh, next feature needed a 210 or, or a large uh, degree fog-free vision. So you needed to be able to look to your left uh, and look to your right uh, and look up and down as well, take the environment. So uh, the next feature on the next slide, uh, this is pretty important. 
we wanted uh, to shoot for a half a degree, a half a PSI positive pressure. So that meant if the suit is under positive pressure, it's going to prevent virus from entering anywhere on the suit, including through small tears or holes. If there was any, any gap anywhere in the design, the positive pressure would keep that virus from entering the suit. This is actually the same me method used in the quarantine in the lunar receiving lab, where the lunar receiving lab was kept on the negative pressure to keep anything from getting out. Uh, another important feature we shot at a requirement was to eliminate shields and masks and other constrictions that this had to be uh, very easy to use and, and very comfortable. And then it had to be low cost. And here's a really important one. It needed to be reusable and sterilizable. And we'll get to that, the reasons for that in a minute. Another feature or requirement that it needed uh, redundancy. So we had to have filtered dual airflow system. Uh, for redundant comfort, redundant temperature control, redundant flow rate. And speaking of filters, uh, a lot's changed since the early days of Apollo when you picked up a millipore filter. And so we selected dual super HEPA filters. So dual, uh, a super HEPA filter will remove a pathogen one-tenth of a micron or, 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 you know, or less. Uh, not much less, but less. COVID-19's uh, size is 0.13 microns or larger. So an individual COVID-19 particle will not get through a super HEPA filter. Many of the filters, masks are nowhere near the efficiency of the super HEPA filter. An N95 mask is not a super HEPA filter. It's not close to that. Uh, masks, the N95 masks work in general because they're designed to stop clumps of uh, uh, of the virus that, that carry, travel in moisture. They are not designed to stop individual uh, COVID-19 pa pathogens. It'll go right through it. Uh, so let's go to the next one. Um, uh, rechargeable batteries and filters uh, had to be implemented uh, for shift continuity when this was being used. So it, uh, it wouldn't be used one time only, which most of the PPE that you see out there is used use the throw at one time only. Uh, next next uh, slide, we had to have the ability for communication, audio, stethoscopes, uh, through Bluetooth connections and, and so on. Uh, and th these are optional, of course, I'm, I'm going the full tilt here. Not all this stuff is in the in prototypes that we built, but these are options of wastewater and food management. And uh, primarily, and most importantly, the, the suit has to be capable of isolating anyone wearing it from the outside, out, outside world, effectively quarantining and controlling early outbreaks. Uh, so that's, those are all the requirements. So uh, let me list a, a summary of the benefits that uh, accrue from these, uh, from these requirements. Uh, and, and the Q suit, was designed using systems engineering and technology migrated from EVA suits for low Earth orbit, the moon and Mars. Uh, it provides maximum protection for microscopic particles, viruses and pathogens in this high risk environment with unknown threats. Uh, there are a range of options and a range of products depending on, on the environment that you're in and the, and the variable uh, variability of that environment that require low cost and high volume production. And uh, reusability, again, it's really important. It, it, it creates lean value compared uh, to single use PPE. Uh, by way of, uh, of uh, comparison, a dentist's office uh, gown that's currently used now in dentist's office, or if you go to get your blood taken at a, a lab, a Quest lab, or you're working in a hospital, uh, Per person it's estimated, because these are throwaway, that the cost to provide these is at least $1,500 per person. But to say nothing of the fact how difficult they are to, to put on all masks and gowns and gloves and booties, and then take them all off again, and start off all over again. So uh, the Q suit is designed for full shift, multiple use, ease of donning and doffing. In so doing, 
it will reduce the stress, the cost, and the risk for a whole multiple range of users. <clears throat> and um, the last item, which is the most significant, is the vision for how this would be used is health and economic benefit through ROR, rapid outbreak response. I'll address that in a, in a moment, but let's just keep that in mind, ROR, rapid outbreak response. So, um, okay, so we've developed this Q suit. How do you use it in the field where the rubber meets the road? How can it stop a pandemic? And I'll talk a little bit about that. In the next slide, I, I made uh, reference to it. ROR is rapid outbreak response. So the notion is if we, this Q suit, if it does all these things we think it can do, our users would constitute individuals, communities, agencies, and countries, uh, anybody that uh, would be at risk. And um, how do you stop, how do you stop it in a bud? Uh, so the, so, so the, the vision is, as soon as an outbreak is identified, there will be within 24 hours, a large supply of Q suits, either by a, uh, a local warehouse uh, or uh, shipping. Uh, there will be enough of these Q suits to cover a, uh, an area that if, you, if the outbreak is identified fast enough, the area will not be large. So maybe it'll be, you know, uh, quarter mile, half a mile, uh, several meters. Uh, we're not talking about going from one state to another state uh, or one community to another community. We're talking about rapid outbreak response. In other words, the outbreak is identified and very soon after the outbreak is identified, QSUIT is available to everybody in that area. So what happens once you don the QSUIT? Uh, you don the Q-suit and you put it on until you, I can, you can identify who has got symptoms and who doesn't. And in some cases, as, as, uh, as difficult as this may sound, it could be 14 days. Uh, it may be a place where you, you put the suit on, you're in this suit until you can isolate those who have symptoms from those who don't. And the ones who are, who are, are symptomatic are then put in a, a more rigorous quarantine facility. But the notion is rapid outbreak response. So um, I wanted to uh, get you to the next. Uh, I'm sure you all have questions about how this would, how this would evolve. And uh, I'm happy to answer them in the, question, the Q and A session. But I wanted to get through the main part of the presentation to tell you what the status is. Uh, because, because this is so closely related to the Mars suit development, I put the status of both the Mars suit and the Q suit uh, next to each other and uh, to show you where we, where we are in the process. So uh, initial funding to build these things are, is in place. So we're already funding two Mars suits and an initial run of Q suits. Uh, in NASA, in NASA jargon, PDR is complete on both of these. Uh, CAD design is in work in the Mars suit. It is complete in the Q suit. Uh, prototypes on the Mars suit, uh, we're expecting hopefully to have two working functional prototypes within the next uh, couple of years. Um, we're already past re revision five on the Q suit, uh, well on our way towards a manufacturable version. Preliminary testing of prototypes is scheduled for 2023 in the Mars suit. And uh, this year in the Q suit, uh, uh, critical design review, same year this year, uh, maybe I'm a little optimistic with 2024 with the Mars suit. Quality, you see qualification testing, all these things, authority to proceed in production. So we anticipate producing quantity, uh, in quantity levels of Q suit uh, next year, where we are now. Uh, so that's the status. I thought I'd show you what, uh, what the CAD runs. This is where we are right now is, is doing computer aided, aided design and, and putting everything in a manufactured version. It's quite an enormous uh, change between a prototype that you build in a lab and a manufactured version. So here you see some of the CAD designs prior to first certification and manufacturing as they're, as they're laid out. Um, 
So let's go to the next slide. So the next slide is a, uh, what you're looking at here is revision uh, five of the prototype. Uh, I'll just point some things out. If you look in the front, there's no openings. There's a uh, helmet that's lit up uh, for view. Uh, there's uh, the operating uh, uh, status lights, which are various uh, levels on off and whether things are, ventilation's working. In the back, uh, you see the four uh, filters, which are screw off super HEPA filter replacements, two inlets and two outlets. And then there's a side view. But what, what I'd like you to do so you can visualize this better is if you click on the Vimeo link at the top and scroll to 11 minutes, it's important you scroll to 11 minutes, uh, you'll see uh, Cam, Cameron Smith, Dr. Cameron Smith is, is on the line and he's our, our uh, wonderful fabricator who's put together this suit and has also, also put together uh, space suits of his own design and tested them. Uh, Cam is a resource uh, that's going to happen without Cam. Uh, you'll see him taking you through uh, how you get into it, how you're moving it, and what it looks like. So what I'd like you all to do, uh, since, um, since we've got a, a few minutes left, is click on that Vimeo link, scroll to 11 minutes, and then uh, look at it for a couple of minutes. And why don't, why don't I say uh, um, we come back at... Uh, what do, you, what do you say, Stokes, at uh, 20 after? Is that a good time you want to allow that? Sure. Uh, you know, I don't think people will be able to click that, though. They'll have to write it down and... and, and, and I think uh, click it. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. No, they don't have... I have the, I'm going to click it. Sorry. I forgot. I thought we all had separate. So let me, let me do that for you. Sorry about that. <clears throat> so uh, here we go. And then that'll make it a lot easier. I'm going to show you uh, how easy it is to put on, uh, run the uh, ventilators a little while, um, and then walk through some more of the design features. The first design feature, really, uh, to see is that it's easy to put on, and you can do it by yourself. This is awfully important. With a lot of personal protective equipment, you need somebody to adjust straps or to uh, zip a zipper, that sort of thing. Um, you don't need that with this suit. You just pull it on like a old pair of coveralls. It goes on quite easily. And you see now I've pulled it up and I've entered through a zipper that goes across the back. Now that zipper is uh, seals up tightly so that no air goes out of it. And I'll come back to that in just a moment. Now you simply slide your arms in And you see they go directly through a cuff ring into your surgical gloves. That cuff ring is very important. It allows air that's circulating in the suit to reach your hands and lets them breathe much more easily through an entire shift, let's say. Now I'm going to put the hood on. And now I'll zip it. And now I turn on the ventilators. So the first point of the suit is that it is easy to put on. It's very flexible. I can move, I can do anything I want. My air is being brought in through these vents, these fans, and it is directed by hoses up into the helmet area. You'll notice that the helmet does not get clogged. Uh, normally, uh, this helmet might clog up and you wouldn't be able to see. Now there's plenty of air though flowing across the face area, the, the visor, and that prevents fogging. 
You'll also note that the visor is large and roomy. That's very important over using the suit for many hours. So now you can see, right now, the BD system, barrier to entry and barrier to exit functioning, barrier to entry is our filters, and then barrier to exit is the length filter. No virus can come in through the filters. Anything that does get through gets quickly washed away from your face, and then everything that goes out of the suit goes out through a filter. We also have the uh, facial and frontal exposure elimination. There's no way for any virus particles to be contacted from the front of the face. There are no suit penetrations. There are no suit holes in the front. That's all in the back. So we're eliminating the face-to-face -face contact uh, potential of virus, in particular with COVID. As I mentioned, it's very comfortable. You can see I can use my hands, I could write, I could use a phone, I could use a pen. And I'll also show you that we can sit down nice and easily. And very importantly, I can sit down and the fans will not be blocked and they do not dig into my suit and my body. I'm seated, and yet the fans continue to run just fine without being blocked. And exit in here. I have a very good rate of flow inside the suit, and so there's no CO2 building up inside. I feel perfectly normal. And we're going to quantify the CO2 numbers in a later test. Right now, the batteries run for a four-hour period, and we can raise that to a seven-hour shift if we like. The battery switch is simply right here in the middle of the chest. We can move that anywhere we like. It could be put on the cuff. It could be on the waist. Those are finer decisions that can be made later. Now I'm going to demonstrate uh, removal of the suit, that is unzipping it. Uh, but first I'm just going to stand under the light and give you a spin all the way around so you can see all of the features that we've just described. Once again, I'll show you how easy the suit is to use. You can notice I'm walking. I can drop something on the ground and pick it up. No problem. I can use pen, pencil, whatever instruments. I could use a phone. Okay, everybody back. I thought it, uh, I thought it'd be uh, a good time to to stop that because the, the video goes on for quite some time, and uh, you can look at it uh, uh, from the recording. And uh, if you look at this, is again, this is a uh, a revision. I mean, uh, a, a early early prototype. If you go back to what the CAD drawings look like, uh, it's going to look much more like a spacesuit, as uh, as you can see how these how the designs have evolved as we get from uh, prototype to pre-manufacturing versions, and you can see how the helmet is uh, configured, going to be configured, um, and a slip-on that holds it together, and uh, lots of other features like that. Uh, but um, I, I thought this would be a good time to uh, to go to questions. Let me stop the uh, content here. Hello. 
Yeah. Okay. So you're ready for questions? Uh, yeah. Let me uh, let me see. How do I get back to Zoom so I can see who who's asking and then yeah. Uh, Just stop your screen sharing. I don't see how to do that. So you got screen broadcasting. Stop. Okay. Let you do it. Well, thanks. That was fascinating, Larry. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, I, did, I want to. I did want to emphasize a, a major point of um, of being able to use this in a full shift, uh, starting with a hospital. So, in a hospital, every time a doctor goes to a patient in the ICU or is dealing with patients, uh, or all the masks, everything that they've got on is one patient only. So when they're done with that, they've got to go to the next one, then the next one, the next one. There is no reusability. There is no sterilizability. Uh, all of that is uh, important features uh, of our design. Uh, once you get reusability, uh, the SUPREP of filters uh, that we use are actually advertised as being good for one year, not one use. Uh, not that we would advocate keeping those filters on for a year, but the, the notion that you could use this suit through a shift and multiple shifts, or more importantly, with rapid outbreak response, uh, once, you, once you know where the outbreak starts and you distribute the suit to as many people as possible, now you're basically quarantining, you're basically stopping the spread of the virus. So how you proceed from there, how long you keep, you know, we, we know generally it's gonna take 14 days for symptoms to develop. Uh, do you want to wear the suit 14 days continually? Obviously you're not gonna do that. The face plate will release, it's on a seal. Uh, so you can go in a back room, a, 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 a clean room, so to speak, where you can, uh, you can have food and water. Uh, as long as you're not near another person, the same standards that we use for separation and social distancing uh, would apply. It would be a place where you could you know, uh, decompress before you put it back in, in use again. But the key number is a uh, maximum of 14 days that you're looking at uh, before you can separate out. So uh, I just want to get that point across before we get, uh, we get uh, uh, general questions. Yes. Right. Thank you. Okay, so Stokes, do you want to yes, you want me to pick one of you? Uh... No, I, I I thought Alan was asking a question there. Um, oh, so so uh, I, I have a question. So uh, let's say this has been available for the current outbreak. I mean, how would you? How would it be done with the with Wuhan if people had just known had or suspected that would you yeah you know, how many of these would you propose being available to to uh, you know cover the people in in China or in the Wuhan you know it, would it be available to to do something like that or was it too too unknown. Well, back when we started, if we had had a Q suit, if we had gone through this whole learning process uh, and had this technology available when it started, the instant the outbreak was developed by the, by the, uh, the, the seafood market, uh, which, which was known, of course, we have no way of knowing what actually, you know, where it was and how many, but there would be a, uh, there would have been a warehouse with up to 500 of these suits. It would have, uh, we would have covered everybody in that area as far as possible and put them in the suit for 14 days. You know, maybe I should let uh, uh, Gene Grace answer this question. He's our CEO and he's got the projected uh, uh, business model, a vision model of how this would work for ROR, rapid outbreak response or rapid containment response. Eugene, you wanna address that question? Yeah, hi everybody, how, how are you all? Um, I think it's probably it's probably fair um, to be clear that that the, the probably isn't a, a realism uh, in 
uh, issuing Q suits to a to an entire population. That's not the uh, that's not the intention. Um, the intention is that at the point that there is a known outbreak, uh, which which could be multiple areas. Um, if you look back at what happened with COVID-19, um, we started in all of our different uh, regions of the world. We started with a known point. So here in the UK, uh, our first uh, recognised outbreaks were four people that came back from a ski trip in Europe. Um, and within the space of five, six weeks, uh, we were then picking up uh, new outbreaks in other areas. Clearly what happens is uh, the, tra the transmission is taking place uh, when at that point in time, we don't really understand what the outbreak is. We don't understand uh, what the circumstances are. We don't know how it's transmitted. We don't know what it's uh, resulting uh, requirements are, uh, what the contaminants are, um, how is it spread, and of course at that point in time we don't know what the implications are. Um, now in this case uh, we, we fairly quickly established that the implications were quite serious, uh, that certainly for older people, for people with underlying conditions, uh, this particular uh, virus was, uh, was quite, quite a serious uh, attack on their respiratory and other uh, and other systems uh, and we all ended up with then this massive uh, um, build-up of uh, traffic in our health systems um, more and more patients being admitted uh, still at that point in time um, people not really understanding what it is they were dealing with and so um, the, the intention here is uh, that it is the people around the outbreak, the people in the hospitals and in the transportation systems that are supporting that outbreak that need to be protected. Um, because at that point in time, we just simply do not understand uh, what the spread will be or what the implications will be. And what happened across the world with COVID-19 is that all of the preparatory arrangements that were in place for an outbreak of, of this type were simply inadequate at every level. And the type of protective equipment that we had, um, which was authorized by all our uh, uh, all our health services um, uh, for that type of outbreak, being simple paper masks, uh, a, a visor, uh, a, um, uh, an, an apron, you know, protective gloves. They were not capable of protecting those people um, from this particular virus. So QSuit takes the view that until we understand it, until we understand how it is trans transmitted and what the implications are for both the parent, for, for both the patients and the carers, we will 100% protect those people who are in that care environment. Um, uh, then, over time, the uh, the scientists and the uh, and the health professionals will get to understand it. And if it is then possible, as it most likely is, uh, that we can downgrade the level of protection or downgrade the level of protection in some less extreme environment. So it may well be that Q-suit protection would remain in force in, in an IC unit, unit or, a, or a, 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 an, an environment where there are patients where those viruses and uh, pathogens are actually in the air. That would remain in place but in administrative areas and, and, and other areas in the, in the hospitals or, or environments, it may be something lesser that's required. But at that crucial period in the beginning, when we simply do not know what we're dealing with, 
we take a blanket approach that says we will protect those carers uh, in those patient environments and stop the spread uh, and stop the implication to, uh, to the health service. Now that, uh, is, uh, that doesn't mean it can't be used for schools, for hotels, for cruise ships, uh, for lots of uh, public agencies other than hospitals. Uh, the anticipated price is going to be well with it, well affordable by individuals. We're, we're guessing it's going to be under 200 bucks for this. Uh, so uh, if you wanted to have one, you could certainly have one. So my question, this is Hal Getzelman, is most people take off their PPE to avoid contaminating their next patient because the outside of the suit is probably contaminated. Are you basically admitting that you're going to cross contaminate all your future patients? You're only going to protect the healthcare workers with this strategy. Yeah, so um, environments, one of the challenges that, that health care professionals face, uh, particularly uh, in, in what we call an ICU or an intensive, intensive care unit uh, environment, is they're going into an environment, they have multiple patients in, in an environment. When they've gone into the environment, then by definition, uh, that entire environment is, is, is infected. Uh, they might have you know four or eight patients in uh, in each one uh, and yes in the perfect environment uh, we would have had a barrier uh, to the entry which would have been physical uh, like a uh, like a decontamination unit almost um, that's a level of impracticality uh, so while they're in that environment then uh, then yes they're using a single suit the suit is designed to be sanitized. So um, they can stay longer in that environment because they have cooling air, because they're not restricted by masks. So their shift in that environment can be longer. But yes, if they came out of the environment, likely they would take the suit off. Um, they would use a different suit if they were going in, but the suit itself is reusable. So it's basically placed in a sanitizing unit. It's like a, a, a it's like a small wardrobe. Uh, effectively, it's hung up in the in the unit, um, and then it's sanitized uh, with a with a special mist. Um, uh, and then when it's reached the end of its cycle, uh, then it's simply reusable. Um, so uh, so that's that's how it would deal with that that scenario. The other part of that is that the stay time of the viable lifetime of the virus is estimated to be less than four hours on a hard surface. Uh, so um, you, you conceivably, if you hung this thing in, in a closet for, for overnight, uh, the virus would denature and it wouldn't be a threat, but that's, uh, that's another issue. Other questions? So what is the shelf life of this? Uh, if you're saying that there will be, these will be stored somewhere. So I guess it could be for a period of years or decades. What, what would, and, and the battery, how, how would the battery storage occur? The battery is, uh, is completely replaceable. Uh, <laughs> everything is replaceable by the user. Uh, so the filters literally screw on, screw off. Um, the battery uh, is in a unit with just two, uh, two, two finger clips on either side. Uh, you press it, slide it off, slide a new one on. Um, rechargeable batteries. Uh, so everything's designed so that the, the, the user does not need another two people to, to, to help them don and doff and, and go through these, these processes. Um, it's, it's, it's kept controlled by the user and, and everything is you know, switch on, switch off, simple, quick, uh, and, uh, and efficient. Uh, the other part of that is that uh, before, if this is a category for uh, PPE, it's, it's categorized as a fully enclosed suit, uh, which means it has to go through certification, both in the US and Asia and the UK and, and Europe. 
So that means that uh, things like shelf life uh, of the materials is all part of that certification process. So um, you can't go to certification process until you have a manufacturable version. Uh, you can't, for instance, you can't take the prototype that you just saw the demonstration of and put it through cert. Uh, because it's not a manufacturer version, it's a handmade uh, version. But uh, we're at the point right now with CAD drawings and things that are, are progressing to the point where CERT is around the corner. Hey, Cindy, did you have a question? You need to unmute. Not anymore. Um, Hal asked the same question I was going to. Thanks. See, anyone else have any questions or comments? Well, I guess I'll uh, start again. Um, you talked first about Apollo and the measures to protect against what everybody suspected was zero risk from a moon virus or biology. But many people, including NASA scientists, have said there was life on Mars. There may well be life on Mars isn't uh, based on the Wuhan lab leak, why would we bring uh, possible pathogens back to Earth to study them? Wouldn't that impose a astronomical risk? Yeah, uh, if you do that, you really, you really have to take great precautions. If you recall the, the chain of protection uh, line that it went is that, um, that the Mars suit is designed, the father of the Q suit is the Mars suit or the mother of the Q suit is the Mars suit. So the Mars suit is designed to actually have, uh, we, we've gotten a lot of, we've learned a lot about how to do the Mars suit from actually going through the process with the Q suit. So the, the, uh, the CAD drawings, uh, which you can uh, go, if you remember, there was a CAD drawing that showed how the filters are done and how, how that they're constructed. But there, there's a, there's a built-in fan together with an inlet filter, together with the, the umbilicals that provide the flow rate. So the concept for the Mars suit is very similar. It's a built-in compressor that brings air, it brings Mars atmosphere, which is 95% CO2 into the torso through a high uh, super HEPA filter. And, and then the pressure is maintained by a relief valve and the relief valve also blows through a super HEPA filter. So the idea is if there's anything out there, it's not gonna get into the suit and it's not gonna get, and if you have anything, you're, it's not gonna get out of the suit because I just think about it, if you had an Apollo type suit uh, and you were looking for evidence of life, uh, there's no doubt you'd find it because you're blowing it out all over the place. You could see from that picture on Apollo 12 and all the effluent is just stuff that's just outgassing. How samples and the sample return are being brought back on the sample return mission that we have uh, with it that, uh, uh, that we have online right now waiting for the next uh, Mars return mission. I have no idea how they're protecting it. I've seen how Perseverance does it. Uh, it. It inserts it into these test tubes. If, if you've taken a look at the, the science, um, uh, you know, instruments on Perseverance, what they're doing is they're collecting, it's just beginning that mission out, it's collecting samples, inserting them into these test tubes, sealing them and dropping them on the surface. And then the follow-on mission, which is uh, gonna be within two years, is, is gonna send another rover that's gonna find these, these samples, gather them up, bring them to a spacecraft. The spacecraft is gonna lift off from Mars and it's gonna to return to Earth. So has this chain of, uh, it's, it's, it's a very good question. Now I don't know, I don't know the, the details of their preventive techniques, but you can see there's a, there's a significant amount of risk if that has not been done. And once it's returned, the other question is, do you start all over again with an Apollo type quarantine? 
How do you handle it? Who handles it once it comes down? These are all questions that need to be asked if they haven't been asked already. I'm glad you brought that point up because I, for one, would love to know what the handling, what the chain of protection is for those samples and the sample return. Yeah, I mean, we've all seen the movie War of the Worlds. We've all seen a Dramadin strain. And I would say maybe the best option is never bring samples back to the Earth do the sample research on the moon or on the International Space Station, but don't bring samples back to a lab because I think we've proved beyond a reasonable doubt that if you have a sample inside of a lab, although it may be unlikely, the consequences of a leak out of a lab are extreme. So maybe, there, maybe the uh, international community needs to, you know, ban bringing pathogens from extra or xeno whatever back to earth that may be the better option not to try to make a better mouse trap but just avoid ever bringing samples back to earth until the science of containment improves well i, I, I would absolutely agree with you and and i think uh now would be the time to, to to raise that because we've just demonstrated across our entire planet that we are unprepared uh, even for the evolution uh, of, of viruses uh, on our own planet. They are, whether, whether they're natural or they're of our own making, uh, let alone the concept of something uh, that is structured in, 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 in some way that, we, uh, that would be so alien to us that we would have no way of dealing with it. Um, but following that on, um, you have to take a view that uh, whilst, it's, uh, whilst it's interesting and, and necessary as we uh, steam closer to more interplanetary uh, exploration, uh, that we consider these things from, uh, from, 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 from off world, um, I, I'm afraid for me, uh, I see a much greater risk uh, to, to, to Earth's population uh, from the evolution of things which are in our own backyards and in our, uh, in our existing um, uh, laboratories. Uh, and I think COVID-19 has just demonstrated that. Um, because the next time round, it's going to be more serious than this. Uh, and, and we simply are not prepared. Yeah, and, I agree uh, that, uh, and so build, building on this, because you, you really brought up, uh, you know, an important point is that th these missions are already they're already paid for. They're in the design process. They're they're scheduled. Uh, the, the sample return mission is is a scheduled mission. Uh, what's the chain of protection, and does it extend all the way back to the users, who will then pick up the samples? dropped, I assume, by parachute somewhere, uh, in some place, uh, as every step in the possible handling of this, of those samples, been thought of. And um, I don't well, know if I, anybody... How is right? Would, would, would this not have been, I mean, the, you know, this can't be the first time it's been raised, but would this not have been the obvious... Um, to, to return it to the, to the International Space Station. That's, that's what it's purposely designed to do. Uh, and, 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 and in a contaminant uh, free environment. It's a damn good point, Hal. You know anybody you can talk to about this? I mean, I, 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 know, I, know, Mar I, I know a couple of people, Penny Boston and Margaret Race, who are in the planetary protection world uh, from Ames, but uh, you, you know, it's, something that needs to be looked at for sure. Well, I think uh, the, um, the uh, kinematics of rendezvousing with the station shakes are much tougher than uh, having a ballistic re-entry into the Utah yeah. desert um, with a parachute. But uh, if you make it a requirement, uh, you know, you may have to go into some halo orbit around the moon and then transfer to another vehicle and then get into the space station or the moon or, you know, um, the outpost uh, around the moon. But 
<laughs> it's uh, like you say, it's paid for the balls rolling, but I think you might have a more than a couple protesters at your launch for the sample return mission based on our experience today that, um, you know, we need to start strategizing how we would do this. And, um, and uh, like you say, um, I know that they do experiments on animal viruses on an island off the coast of New England as a measure of protection from the viruses escaping that island. But I don't know how you could create an island around a lab of a, uh, you know, a uh, Mars virus or a Mars pathogen, how you could realistically do that. The better way is to have a, a big chunk of space around it. Yeah, I'm not sure that the ISS would uh, be prepared to handle samples in a safe way either, and you wouldn't want to contaminate all the crew there because they still got to come back. Yeah, well, uh, I'm afraid this one is uh, is for a different group on another day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but thanks for raising it for sure. <laughs> I agree. Gentlemen, I have to uh, to bail out. It's getting late here in the UK. Uh, it was a pleasure to uh, to meet you all, uh, and uh, hopefully we'll talk again soon. Well, Gene, thank you so much for for participating, and, and good luck with your company. I think with uh, people like Larry on board, I think you guys are in pretty good shape. We've, we've got a really good chance. See you, Gene. All right, guys, take care of yourselves. Thank you. Yeah. Thank so you. Any more questions uh, for, for Dr. Kuznos? Okay, then Larry, thank you so much. Great, great presentation, most fascinating. Thank you, Stokes. Thanks everybody for attending. And if you're if you have more interest, uh, Stokes knows how to get a hold of me, be happy to answer your questions. At some point, we're probably going to need uh, a lot more investment than we have to make this in quantity. So if you, any, if you know any philanthropists out there, we're happy to talk to them. Okay, yeah, and, and anyone uh, wants to uh, contact him, let me know and I'll, I'll give you his email. So uh, let me tell you about next month's uh, first Thursday meeting. Uh, it'll be on September 2nd. And our speaker is going to be Dr. Brian Kusian, uh, who's the lead scientist for NASA's Im immunology research. And he'll discuss uh, changes to an astronaut's immune system during spaceflight, as well as how to develop countermeasures to help mitigate the clinical risks for astronauts during long duration missions. So this should be a, a you know another science-based uh, presentation, and I think it'll be mo most interesting. So uh, so we'll uh, stop the recording right now.